this uh, is uh, a bit of an extra curricular material as in uh, it's extra curricular in that you don't really see homework assignments that or a nuance any timed assessment questions that relate to these but it's only a bit extracurricular because it does relate to what we cover. And I think it relates to the multivariable calculus that either you are supposed to be taking right now or you have taken um, just before this class. And so I wanna talk about that. Uh, I When I first taught physics 4B, like three, four years ago, I made the mistake of thinking that this was um, uh, thinking what I was going, what I am now going to point out is very, um, uh, very crucial and important because that's what my impression of it was from the upper division electrodynamics, and I really liked it. But I think at the lower division electromagnetism, uh, we don't really use it all that much. When we talk about electromagnetic induction, we usually only use the voltage that comes from electromagnetic induction. That's why it's not so emphasized. That's why you don't really have a homework assignment on that. Um, but since I think we have time today, I thought it would be good to lecture on this material. So let me start from here. Let me, um, I'm gonna need some annotation tools. Let me bring those over. So uh, let me start by noting some things that you will see in the uh, chapter. So I will start out with the chapter 13, knowing I'll go back to chapter 12 for some materials. So let me just go into section 13.4, induced electric fields. There's really one expression that I want to write down from here, which is this. This is, Faraday's law. This is the uh, standard way it's written and presented. So uh, let me write that in the corner. And this is where it's nice that zoom annotations stay with the screen so I can just collect it here. So Faraday's law says the, oh, sorry, I need a little more white space there. Okay. Faraday's law says that this line integral here, uh, it's a line integral of either electric field along a path. And this uh, loop thing says that that path is a closed loop. That line integral is given by uh, change in the magnetic flux. So huh, they use that. I, I prefer B because B is the letter we use for magnetic field. So it's uh, equal to rate of change of magnetic flux, but there's a minus sign there. And you know, in the lecture, we go into what the minus sign means and how that's related to Lenz's law. So that's what Faraday's law says. And in the context, most context of this class, we just uh, focus on the fact that this quantity here, it gives you induced the voltage. And most of the time, we just want the voltage that gives us what we want. So we just work with that. We don't really try to find the electric field. So, so okay. <laughs> now, what I wanted to do was, I wanted to compare this to a situation where we do try to find the thing inside the integral. And I want to show this to you side by side so that you can see a remarkable similarity between Faraday's law and Ampere's law. Let me get to Ampere's law. So when you look at Ampere's law, let me get to the part where it is and I'm gonna copy it here. Okay, this looks about right. Um, yeah, so that's Ampere's law. Let me copy it over to the corner and you can see how similar Ampere's law and Faraday's law are in, in terms of uh, mathematical form. So Ampere's law says that this line integral, uh, that product, between magnetic field and some path, and the path is around a closed loop, that quantity is given by a current uh, here. That I is supposed to be I enclosed. And in the lecture, I talk about what, what it means for current to be enclosed. So let me write this down. Um, let me use the constant that I'm trying to use more. So you can rewrite this mu naught as 
4 pi times Coulomb constant over C squared. So that's how I'm gonna write it. 4 pi Coulomb constant over C squared times the current enclosed. And if you forget the physics of for a minute, then there's a great deal of, so the reason I say forget the physics for a minute is because in terms of physical interpretation, there is a distinction and difference. So in terms of physical interpretation, when you look at this E dot DL, that is a very clear interpretation. That's voltage. That's the definition of voltage. When you look at B dot DL, line integral of magnetic field along the path, um, that doesn't have any physical meaning. Like the quantity means nothing <laughs> because you know that's not related to work. Mag the way magnetic force works is different. And um, so when you're looking at the physical quantity itself, um, you don't really see the similarity between these, these two expressions. And you know it's also hard to see similarity between current and closed and the the rate of change of magnetic flux. So, so that's what I mean if you forget the physics for a minute. If you ignore the physical meaning assigned to these symbols. So if you just look at the algebra, if you just look at the mathematical expressions, this is, a, I hope you see the similarity. You have, um, so both of these magnetic field and electric field, they are examples of what's called a vector field. They give you a vector quantity and it's a function of position and possibly time even. Magnetic field is an example of vector field and so is the electric field. It's an example of vector field. So think of, thinking of both of these quantities as vector field, <laughs> okay, forgetting their physical meaning for a minute, what you have here is a dot product of a vector field with a path, dot product with a vector field with a path, and you take the path along a closed, uh, closed uh, loop, then you have this uh, integral of the vector field equaling some constant value on the right-hand side. I guess, uh, um, well, let, let me say they are constant. I mean, you, you can make, come up with a situation where they're not constant, but let's just say that we made it so that they are constant. So we have, um, so we have that arrangement. Some vector field, that product with a path of a, a closed loop, you integrate over, that's equal to some quantity on the right. So, so that similarity in mathematical form, it gives you something. You can, um, you can get some things out of that. And I will show that to you in a minute. Um, as we get into that, I want to bring back the, the physical meaning here because there's a, or should I call it physical? It might be better description might be the conceptual meaning here because sometimes it's very easy to get lost in fancy mathematical expressions and forget uh, conceptually what these expressions mean. So this is what these uh, expressions mean. And this is the way I like to kind of present. So these are two of the uh, four Maxwell's equations. And I like to talk about Maxwell's equations even in physics 10, uh, but you know, with the people who haven't taken calculus. Uh, I still like to describe these expressions in terms of um, uh, using English language in, in terms of um, plain, plain phrase that still has a meaning that's not, that's not wrong. <laughs> So this is how you can describe it in those uh, conceptual terms. You can say, uh, so this is the Ampere's law. And if I describe the Ampere's law this way, it, you know, it would be imprecise. It's not as precise as, ma as mathematical expression would be. And within the limitation of imprecision, it's, uh, it's as correct as it can be. So this is what I would say. Ampere's law says magnetic field is produced by 
electric current or by current. Or you can turn it around, put it another way. Current is source of magnetic field. This is uh, how I mean it. The terms you see on the right hand side here, this is what you could call source term. This is in a conceptual sense. This is what produces the things on the left hand side. So if my current here were zero, then it's very easy to make the left hand side hand side zero by making magnetic field zero. I mean, it doesn't mean that it has to be, but um, for the for this quantity to be non-zero, uh, somewhere current has to be non-zero. So, so when you read this calculus calculus expression, you can say that. Um, this expression here is what says the current is the source of magnetic field. And the upside of describing this uh, Ampere's law expression that way is you can, you can say something similar, something very similar about the, about the induced electric field as well. So what Faraday's law says is, okay, so we have electric field. Okay, let me just write that down for now. Electric field is, and your textbook will draw a distinction between induced electric field and static, electrostatic electric field. And there is a real distinction there. And I'll talk about that in a couple minutes. So I can say electric field is produced by, and what is it? What is it produced by? I guess this really takes some math to describe what it is. So again, this is what I would call source term. So if uh, this source term is zero, it's very easy to make the induced electric field zero. And the way this wouldn't be zero is if uh, the magnetic flux had a non-zero rate of change. So let me say electric field is produced by, um, let me just ch say change of magnetic flux. I think that's a um, fair description of what's on the right hand side. Change of magnetic flux is the source of the electric field that's shown on the left. Um, so uh, magnetic flux V uh, or the change <laughs> in magnetic flux is the uh, source of uh, induced electric field. And with the conceptual description, um, what this similarity in the mathematical form means is there are things that you might have noticed when you are dealing with the magnetic fields. Those are directly applicable to whenever you are dealing with whenever you are dealing with the induced electric field. So let, here's the biggest thing. It's something that your textbook notes with a little bit of a mistake that I already filed there at town. <laughs> so this is a, one of the first, not, okay, not the first. This is one of the things that your textbook says at the top of this section. It gives you something about a property of a magnetic field. It says, that a fundamental property of static magnetic field is that unlike an electrostatic field, it is not conservative. And they are absolutely right. Magnetic field is not a conservative field. Now, uh, what they say a little bit later is not quite right. Um, okay, so this is not quite right. Uh, you know, a conservative field is the one that does the same amount of work on a particle moving between two different points, regardless of the path chosen. Um, what they should really say is that a conservative vector field, as in, uh, we are talking about a mathematical quantity. Uh, we are not talking about the uh, force and work. So we are in the realm of math. And conservative vector field is defined as one where 
the line integral, like this integral here, is a path independent. Uh, so they chose to describe this integral as amount of work. And that is true for electric field, but for magnetic field, because the magnetic force is really weird. Um, the, this line integral, it doesn't correspond to the work done by magnetic field. But so, so with the caveat, with the caveat, what they say here is absolutely right, that uh, the property of magnetic field as a vector field is that it's not conservative. And that has a very, very specific mathematical meaning that I um, I want to point out. And, and that the mathematical meaning, it, it, it can be shown visually. And that's what's uh, really striking about uh, these properties. And I think the best way to show this is uh, on the Wikipedia page for vector fields, um, which I hope touches on the topics you cover in multivariable calculus. And uh, I guess um, I should give you a full discourse uh, vector field. I should give you a full disclosure, which is um, I've never taken multivariable calculus. When I was undergrad, they let me take upper division electrodynamics instead of uh, vector calculus, multivariable calculus. So I never went back and actually took it. <laughs> but I do know what I need to know to be able to do physics. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so that's the full disclosure. But what I will tell you is that I think the reason the math department at UC Berkeley accepted my upper division electrodynamics coursework as a replacement for the lower division multivariable calculus requirement is that there's a lot of overlap. When you're doing electrodynamics, particularly at upper division level, there is a lot of multivariable calculus stuff that you just have to learn. And and some of those things we are basically skipping over. Uh, most of the semester, we are presenting this integral form of the Maxwell's equations. And at the very end of the semester, I will um, show you the differential form and talk about the differential form a little bit. And, and so, so that's coming. Um, and let me write down one more expression, which uh, I think will uh, draw a good contrast to these, uh, these two expressions. Let me clean up the space a little bit here and, um, and uh, write down the one other equation that looks kind of like Ampere's law and Faraday's law, but it's actually very different. And it, uh, that different form is tied to what different aspects or properties of vector field that it describes. So if you think that's enough, let me write down Gauss's law. That's the thing that looks kind of like Ampere's and Faraday's law, but when you look into it a little bit more carefully that it looks rather different. So Gauss's law says that this integral, it's over some closed geometrical object, but that geometrical object is not a line, but it's an area. Gauss's law says that this quantity is equal to four pi Coulomb constant times the amount of charge enclosed. And if you look at this expression carefully, you can assign meaning or you can give it a conceptual description, similar way I've given to Ampere's and Faraday's law. You can say that this type of, uh, you can say that this type of electric field is produced by static electric charge or by electric charge. You can say that electric charge is a source of this type of electric field. And even though these two expressions look very similar, there is a distinction between them. Here, the integral is the one dimensional integral around the closed loop. Here, it's a two dimensional integral um, over a closed surface. And that distinction becomes more manifest if you look at the, the if you look at the differential form. The differential form of Gauss's law is, looks like this, the divergence. 
of the electric field, the vector field, is equal to 4 pi Coulomb constant times the charge density. And the differential form of Faraday's law says the curl of the electric field is equal to uh, minus rate of change of not electric field, rate of, of rate of change of the magnetic field. So when you write down the differential form, then the mathematical difference between the two is, becomes much more clear. Here, I'll just have to ask you to watch out for that key subtle difference between the area integral and the line integral. And this is the property of a vector field that each of these uh, forms of expression relates to. Um, so let me scroll down. I, when I was looking at this page a little bit before the virtual class session, I saw um, vector field that where I can, I can tell you is indicative of a vector field that's uh, produced by source of this form. And so, you know, this page has a kind of a general, more generic vector field here with uh, something like this, um, you know, it could, uh, I don't know, if uh, someone were to ask me, um, what would uh, this integral look like in a vector field like this? Or what would this integral, or sorry, there's the, in a, in a kind of general vector field like this, if uh, someone were to ask, um, how, how does what's in here relate to a quantity like this? Or how does what's in here relates to quantity like this? Um, you know, here, I, I, it's not very all that clear. This is a kind of an arbitrary vector field. It can be anything. <laughs> um, but this page shows two very distinct types of a vector field that is clearly related to one or the other uh, mathematical features um, that, uh, so this one relates to the divergence and this one, and this one relates to the curl. So let me show you those vector fields. Um, it, the first, it's a, this one shows a vector field that has to have, or yeah, yeah, I think it has to have divergence. Now, you know, this is still somewhat arbitrary looking <laughs> vector field. So it doesn't, it's not necessarily electric field. It's, uh, you know, it could be something different. But when you look at this set of arrows, they have, um, they have a kind of distinct feature in that all these arrows seem to be pointing into one uh, location, um, or if you reverse the direction, then it would be these arrows appear to point away from that point. And if you kind of imagine a three-dimensional version of that, where in three dimensions, you have these arrows pointing towards a point, then that's the kind of a vector field that is associated with this. Because you can imagine defining a kind of a surface, and the dot product of the vector and the surface area element will on net point in the same ish direction. So when you cal when you calculate this, the, the the flux of the vector field, you do get some non-zero quantity. And in electro electrostatics, that relates to the amount of charge enclosed. So so this is an example of a vector field where this uh, integral over some surface that you define that includes this point would be non-zero. But if you imagine calculating something like this, the um, something like a dot product over um, or some kind of a path integral over a path, then this is a kind of vector field that would result in a zero uh, for that. When you look at it, so let me just draw a path to help visualize. Imagine you have a path that looks like that. And I guess uh, with this particular one, you could arrange it so that maybe it's, it is not zero, but um, this is kind of what I'm looking at. 
So if we are looking at this path or this path here, the vectors are kind of perpendicular. So you, the line integral here would give you zero line integral. Now along this path, these vectors is where if you did e dot dl, you would get positive line integral. But along this path, you are going opposite to the direction of the vector field. So you can imagine that if you calculate e dot dl here, this would be negative. And for fields that are say produced by uh, static charges like here, then these integrals always work out so that they are zero. And this is really what leads people to say that electric field is a conservative field. The line integral, uh, when you take an integral from one point to the other, it doesn't depend on what path you take. Because if you had a, uh, because any kind of two different paths can be related by a loop like this. And if uh, integral of around that loop is zero, then you can, um, you can change the path from one to the other without there being any change in the integral. So the integral is path independent that makes it a conservative field. So, so that's, a, um, the, that's the uh, vector field <laughs> description of what matches to what we discussed under Gauss's law. Now, what we talk about in Faraday's law and technically what we did talk about in Ampere's law is another type of vector field that looks very different from what you see with Gauss's law, what you see with the static electric field. And it looks like this. This is an example of a vector field that um, uh, in which um, I guess the first quantity, this uh, will probably be zero because I can kind of imagine if I have a path that looks like this, then, or not path, sorry, surface like that, then my surface normal would uh, go like that. And I can imagine, oh, the dot product there is gonna be zeros. And over all the path, I can imagine where, even though the, the value of the field is not zero, this uh, dot product here would be zero. So um, when you compute this quantity, you, are not guaranteed to have non-zero quantity. But this kind of um, vortex looking vector field is one where, it's a one where you, um, if you imagine doing a calculation like this one, the line integral around the closed loop, then you can see that as you go in a closed loop, uh, make sh making sure to contain this point that the direction of the line and the direction of the field goes in the same direction. And to, for it to be like this, there has to be something that kind of looks like a vortex. And when you have that, you, um, you, you get a vector field that looks like an induced electric field and actually also looks like a magnetic field that's produced by current. And when you see a vector field like that, there should be some kind of a source here. And for us, that source, for us in the context of magnetism, that source is current. So um, if you had a current that's coming out of the screen at that point I marked, then you would have a magnetic field that's going around in the direction indicated there. Or in the case of, so that's the magnetic field description. And what this uh, mathematical similarity means is you can imagine an analogy that can help you get a hold on what induced, how induced electric fields are generated and what they look like. So I described this source as a current. That's the case of Ampere's law. I can be imagine describing it as current, or I can imagine this as a region containing magnetic field. And that magnetic field is going to be changing in value so that this magnetic flux is changing over time. So this source can also easily be the rate of change of magnetic flux. 
And if I have that arrangement here, that I can imagine a, like a solenoid that's producing a magnetic field uh, that's you know straight uh, magnetic field that almost looks like a current if you just saw the arrows. And the, the amount of current in the solenoid can be changing in such a way that it produces this change of flux over that area. And what Faraday's law tells me is that that will induce electric field that goes around that source of the induced electric field. And in purely mathematical terms, that'll look a lot like magnetic field due to a line of current. And so, so I want you to draw that comparison and that, that there's a great deal that you can, great deal of intuition you can gain about the induced electric field by thinking of it as being somehow a bit similar to magnetic field. And that um, that way of looking at it, do I want to clear this? Yeah, let me clear it. That way of looking at it justifies some of the things that they say in the section, section 13.4, induced electric field. They say this, um, that here, specifically the induced electric field is non-conservative because it does a network in moving a charge over a closed path. And yeah, the, the, it's a, in, in terms of a vector field, it's a non-conservative field because when you have vector field that looks like this, then um, wait, E rotational, why are they saying? Oh. That's called the rotational. Never mind. <laughs> okay, sorry. I, I never took um, multivariable calculus, so that's probably one of the terms that I should have learned that I never learned. <laughs> um, so, um, so you know, this is not a, a conservative field, and actually, that ties to what they are saying here that it cannot be written as a gradient of a function, because the function whose gradient this can would could be written as that function would be the scalar potential that you can attach to a, co a conservative field, and because uh, in the case of electric field um, the direction of electric field is the direction of force, this is a sense of non-conservative it applies as a vector field, and it also applies as a like uh, a force. The force due to an induced electric field is non-conservative. And um, what I want to assure you of is um, energy conservation on the whole is still valid because in producing this uh, induced electric field, which is non-conservative, there has to be a change of magnetic field. So that would mean change of current and there's enough complexity there. You can figure out where the energy is coming from and where the energy is going. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll just leave that there, but it it helped. It, I think uh, drawing that analogy between the electric field produced through Faraday's law and magnetic field produced through Ampere's law, that analogy will help you gain um, understanding of uh, things like what they're saying here, um, what it means for why induced electric field is non-conservative and the mathematical features of this. There are some things about magnetic field that's um, I think uh, easier to uh, visualize. Let me see if I can show it somewhere here. Um, I guess this particular heuristic or feature, it's not necessarily something that's uh, useful in this class. It was useful in upper division. Um, I guess it's uh, maybe described the best this way. Let me show you the magnetic field of a thin straight wire and the magnetic field of a magnetic field of even a current flow. So when you have a thin straight wire is when you have a straight current. When you have a straight current, that tends to produce magnetic field that goes in circles around it. Okay, I mean, that's kind of what you saw here. And that's why I imagine the current that's coming out of the screen here. And 
when you have current that's going in a circle, like in a current loop, that tends to produce a straight magnetic field in the center. So here you have a circular current loop. I guess that must be oriented so that at the top it's going, it's coming out of the screen and at the bottom it's going into the screen so that the magnetic field goes from left to right. Um, so when you have that circular loop of current in the middle, it tends to produce a straight magnetic field. And it, the solenoid is the extreme version of the where that um, you know works out exactly what I figured. Well, here you have circular currents and the straight magnetic field, and that kind of geometric relationship it holds for induced magnet induced electric fields as well. So the here the induced electric field is kind of going in circles when the change in the magnetic or magnetic field whose change is producing these is straight. So when you have a solenoid magnetic field that's producing the electric, induced the electric field, the induced electric fields tend to look circular. And um, I guess if you have a magnetic field in a toroid, then you can have a setup where induced the electric field in the middle is kind of a straight-ish. So when you have a, uh, when you have magnetic field that's produced by an arrangement like this, so you have a magnetic field that's going in the loop. And if you imagine inducing an electric field through a change in magnetic field here, the induced electric field will kind of look like a dipole electric field. Yeah. So um, yeah, <laughs> and you can just keep going in loops like that. So, so that's what I wanted to talk about. I guess uh, that turned out to be a lot longer than I had anticipated.